and I'm delighted to say that today I'm joined by Stephen Whitaker, who is the Chief Executive Managing Director of uh, a Fellows Auctioneers, which has been having a, um, an interesting time during the pandemic because, of course, online auctions have been um, you know, a reasonably strong part of the part of the market. So let's see how how the business has been been faring, and uh, and see how things are uh, might might de develop later on this year as well. It's very good to to see you again, Stephen. How are you doing? Hi, Rob. We're all good here. I hope you're all well at that end too. Yeah, good, good. Um, so how so how have have the things been going? In the in the auction business, I keep sort of seeing the you know the big blockbuster auctions out of Geneva or Hong Kong seem seem to be obviously with nobody in the sale rooms, but but the you know the activity seems as strong if not stronger than ever. Yeah, I I mean obviously so much of what happens in those auction rooms is of interest to us because we're passionate about watches. But frankly, it's so above my pay grade I can barely catch my breath on occasions at some of the things they not only get to handle and catalogue and enjoy uh, you know doing the condition reports on and then they sell them for multi zero figures that i just can't understand but we've been jolly lucky because first of all we're handling a product that everybody knows and understands and the watch aficionados are no less passionate about their watch collections than they were pre-march the 26th the, the one benefit of this is that i think people have been able to review their collections some people have decided even to sell odd pieces from their collections and kind of improve their collection by buying other pieces. It might be from us or it might be from any other auction house in the UK or from any other of the really reputable dealers and retailers out there who handle fantastic timepieces. So it's actually not necessarily been a total challenge. There's been some opportunities. And the, the internet, I think we're all, as we are doing this interview now on Zoom, we are all so much more familiar with the technology, so much more comfortable about it, and in a way, so much more trusting of it in a way, because we're talking to people about uh, watches that they might want to consign to an auction. Uh, they show us a watch, we tell them what we think it's worth, and then hopefully they send it to us, or people look at a watch that we have in an upcoming auction. Uh, we've already got all the details on the website, but then we can show them more images by using a small camera, and, and people are actually, yeah, I think, you know, behaving really well and treating each other really fairly during this. So we're, um, although there are challenges, as I'm sure there are for many other small businesses, uh, we're 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 quite actually buoyed up by how we've come through it. Mm. I mean, did, did you did you feel that way in in mid March or the end of March when when you know the real fear was was taking hold? I, I certainly saw you know two, two or three weeks of just pandemonium, and then and then things settled down and people started to 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 get their head around the issues. Well. We actually had an auction scheduled for the, I think it was the Thursday after the sort of Tuesday shutdown. And uh, we actually sort of took all the computers home, set them up around my dining room table. My wife fed me sandwiches. My daughters clerked the auction. We had people from home uh, doing telephone bidding for members of the public. And uh, it went surprisingly well. And uh, it just sort of eased us into the new reality that we were then going to face. It certainly was quiet to start off with, and everything was quiet. I mean, even sort of sitting outside in the garden when we had all that lovely weather, you couldn't hear the, 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 the road traffic, you couldn't hear anything. But gradually there's signs of it picking up now, and, and certainly now here in the jury quarter in Birmingham, there's, there's a quiet little buzz of people, you know, nipping around, doing things, finishing off jobs they should have finished off before they went on lockdown, and people kind of expectantly waiting for something to happen. And, and other than not being able to hold um, sales in your actual sale room, what, what were the differences you, you've seen over the last few months? I, I suppose it's just the lack of actually seeing your clients uh, face to face. Um, we can see them obviously on Zoom and we've been able to talk to an awful lot of people by appointment on Zoom and talk to them about selling things or maybe buying things and that's worked really well. I think it's just we're, we're all mi missing out on you know dealing with the personalities that this wonderful industry has within it and, and the sharing of information although there's a lot of people doing really good and interesting webinars out there it doesn't like actually sitting talking to a dealer about a watch to learn about it and to you know 
glean some experience from him or her about that particular item. So I think we're missing out on that a bit, but by and large, the functionality of the rest of it's worked really well. I mean, we're now all experts, even more than ever, at packing stuff up. I think there was one, one day when we went to the post office with over 360 parcels. So we had this sort of trail of Father Christmas-like sacks as we stood in our queue, two meters apart from the people in front and two meters from the person behind us. And we got to the counter and I could see the postmaster's face just drop. And we said, there's only about 370 in here. <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's a different world. And actually, at, at a moment when the post office are just laying off 2,000 workers, I, 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 I want to take my hat off to the Royal Mail because they've looked after us really, really well. Their staff have been really friendly. They've had to put up with some abuse, I suspect, from some members of the general public. We found them absolutely amazing. And... Uh, Hats off to them for the hard work they've done. And, and have you got a sense of how your customers have been, been feeling? I mean, was there any panic selling at the beginning? And you, you talked about them, them looking at their collections and maybe just reassessing. That sounds like a pretty genteel process rather, <laughs> rather than any sort of fire, fire sale go, going on. Was, was that the general, general mood? I, I think at the outset, people were so gobsmacked that actually the lockdown that everybody knew was coming had actually come and they sort of sat I think and rocked back on their heels for a couple of weeks. Mm. The government furlough scheme I think for a lot of people you know reassured them and a lot of small businesses certainly around us in Birmingham uh, were given grants by Birmingham City Council so the initial financial panic was taken out of it. I suspect for many the real financial crisis is going to come perhaps in the next two weeks through to, to to Christmas. Nobody really knows what's going to happen. And the state of the general economy will affect people's sense of confidence, their sense of well-being, and their willingness to spend either on specialist websites like ours or with retailers or with specialist collectors. So I, I think it's a little early perhaps to judge. We haven't seen any fire sales yet anyway. And have you, have you had to sort of reshape remodel your business in any way to a to get through the initial sort of panic and b to make sure that you're fit and, and ready for what might be you know quite a protracted recession yeah i mean i i've had to do jobs because a reasonably si sized auction house we employ over 60 people and when you're only working on 40 percent of your staff i've had to rediscover rediscover jobs that i've not done for uh, perhaps 20 or 25 years which has been an eye-opener for me I'll be a lot more understanding of my staff in the future when they say that's how long this job takes because I now know how long it takes. I mean, going forward, um, we're still only working at just over half the staff back at work. We've got a lot of staff who are still on furlough who, who surprisingly are itchy, itching to get back. I think they're probably just bored out of their tiny minds. I, I'll soon change their opinions on that. But I mean, they, they, they are keen to get back and get on and, and I think that's true of so many people they just want some kind of um, I can say normality but I don't think normality is a word that we can um, you, you use too easily I think it's they want to discover what the new world is and the new world for us is very much more um, dealing with people online going that extra mile to make sure that people are comfortable about what they're bidding from us the old auctioneers adage of buyer beware I'm afraid to say isn't going to work anymore. You know, you've got to make sure that the clients really know what it is they're bidding on and that they're comfortable and make sure they get it quickly. I mean, we just happen to send out nearly everything we sell, we post for free. And actually, it's, it's a little bit of a cost, but it uh, persuades people that we're interested in them wanting to buy with us. And as I say, the post office have been immaculate. So we could hold a sale on a Monday, people pay overnight. Monday night, we see the invoice on Tuesday morning, post it Tuesday lunchtime, and they get it Wednesday morning. It's not quite Amazon, but it's not far off. No, it's certainly uh, it's, a, it's a move forward for a sort of 400-year-old industry, I, I, would, I, I would say. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not terribly sure uh, there's going to be a whole load of them. For, uh, and we're, we're really spot because, I mean, watches, I mean, first of all, they're, they're quite nice and small. They're fairly robust, so you can package them. I mean, I think if you had a, I don't know, a fantastic glass vase to send, you might be slightly less enthusiastic about consigning it to, uh, to the postal service. But uh, that may be unfair. Maybe it would arrive safely. 
Now, you, now fellows moved pretty early into um, online auctions. Um, I guess there was, was a, a steady, slow, steady um, take up in the in the early years. But do you, do you think that this pandemic is going to really accelerate that and and make it far and away the dominant way that people will bid and bid and buy uh, watches? Yeah, well, I think watches and or any other product, frankly. Um, we, we did an online, I think we had the first sort of online aggregator website involvement in an auction with us about 25 years ago. And I think for about the first 10 years, we really felt we were wasting our time. There was a, a low level of trust. Um, but now I think um, people are more, first of all, most auction houses are a lot more careful about how they describe things and a lot more consistent about trying to get things right. So people, you know, should be able to buy from auction houses or, or indeed from any other um, website entity that's selling things online with confidence because, you know, you have protection under the Consumer Credit Act, if you're paying by credit card, and of course, just under trades description. So people are more confident and uh, they just, however, do expect a higher level of service than perhaps they might have done in the past because they are now so much more accustomed to dealing with the big companies like Amazon, ASOS, and all these other companies who, of course, you know, will deliver things extremely quickly. So if you want to be in the online environment, you've got to kind of look over your shoulder and see what is the standard. And the standard is a phenomenally quick service and also an ability to respond quite positively to situations when they go wrong. Because in inevitably, you're not always going to get a happy customer, although obviously you try to make sure that you do. You've just got to be open to understanding why the customer might not be as enthused about it as you were. And that's a sort of, a, it's a difficult situation sometimes to handle, but um, it's well worth investing the time in trying to understand the customer's point of view. Yeah, it must have changed changed dramatically working online over the over the last twenty five years, and it, and I guess your customer profile must have changed from being mostly, you know, geographically in 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 the Birmingham area twenty five years ago to to being global today. Yes, I mean, I think um, for for various sort of quite obvious reasons, our, our reach is strongest in the UK. You know, buyers in America will tend to buy from American auction houses out of preference. But as soon as you get something that's really unusual, then, you know, the, the world opens up and has a look at that particular item. So when you're at the top end of the major brands, the Rolex, the Pet Philippe, the Vacheron, and generally buyers um, expect you to behave in the same way as their own industry would, you know, in their own country would behave. So sometimes there's a few differences there, but typically, we will always be strongest where English is the first language. So, you know, we will have strong bidders from America, uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Ireland. Um, but then we do really quite well uh, with the Northern European countries because they, are, you know, they have a different view of the watch world from us, you know, the, the, particularly sort of the German and the Scandinavian buyers are very passionate about uh, Amiga. Whereas perhaps in the UK, Rolex might be perhaps the number one choice for uh, UK-based buyers. Um, we also, of course, like many auction houses, have a lot of interest uh, from the Far East. And so having Chinese speakers on our staff also helps when it's dealing, when we get to deal with them and also trying to, you know, get getting them to understand the way we do business. Mm. I mean, do you, do you ever think about how you fit into the wider ecosystem, particularly, particularly the secondary market? Because when I, you know, when I look back five years, the, you know, the speed of development of players like Watchfinder, Chrono24, Chronext, uh, there's so much information out there now about um, vintage watches, pre-owned, new and unworn watches. I mean, the, the, the sheer volume of data out there for people to, to absorb means that, that they, uh, that a far wider number of people, a far, a far greater population could you know, get into this habit, get into this hobby of of, uh, uh, of watches. Yeah, and the the other platforms which are out there, and you quite rightly say, you know, display an incredible variety of fascinating timepieces at all price points as well. I think it just depends on the buyer, how they want to approach buying, or indeed a seller, how he wants or she wants to sell their piece. 
So some people may find using the services of WatchFinder uh, more convenient and matches their aspirations. Others may just say, well, actually, you know what? I'd, I'd rather, although it might be slightly more protracted, I'd, I'd rather go to auction. Maybe by showing it to a wider market, I, I might get that little bit extra interest. But all of these other services have a position. And I don't think, although we all overlap, we're, we're all kind of competing uh, for the same audience. It's not sort of, um, it's not a bad type of competition. We, we look at what they're doing. I, sure if they're having a very idle moment and i rather doubt people like watchfinder ever have an idle moment because they're really really busy and really successful um but, I, but i'm sure we're, we're all trying to deliver a good service it doesn't do any of us any good to uh, denigrate the activities of another platform because frankly we're all doing it slightly differently for a slightly different market and and providing there's and I'm sure there isn't anything wrong being taking place, providing we're all doing it with the best intentions in the world and keeping the watch sort of, you know, the aficionados of watches happy, then, you know, we, we all have our place and should all respect each other as a result. Mm. I just wondered whether there might be a, an impact just in terms of the, the speed that people want their money. So if you, if I, if I want to sell a, you know, a Daytona or something, I, I can get cash for that any day of the week in in myriad different ways whereas to go the au the auction route is is a more in, involved process and i just wonder whether you you know as a as a competitive issue might have to look at ways to um i don't know get money get money to people quick more quickly just speed up the process somehow yeah it's um it, it's surprising that it is very rarely that is the issue why people decide or don't decide to use our services. I mean, we, we do have um, access to a third party uh, lending platform who if somebody wanted to consign something into an auction and said, but I kind of need the money right now, not in three weeks, four weeks or whatever the time lapse is, um, who will, you know, subject to one or two, or more than one or two, frankly, but, you know, go, going through a process Will, will advance the owner of the watch um, a percentage of its likely realizable value. And that, that's, quite, that's quite a good service to, to have available. But it's surprising, I, th I think I've only ever been asked for it. It's been around, but we've had it sort of on the back burner here um, for about three years, I would guess. And I think I've only heard it come up in conversation um, once. And I, I just think, it's a service that's available, but it's never really been an issue. Um, and of course, some people think, and they, they may well be right, and I hope they're right, that by putting it to auction and putting it to a very wide audience, they may get slightly more money. And that doesn't mean at all that the other platforms are not offering a fair price. They are probably offering a very fair price because we're all watching what each other is doing. Um, but it may just be that in the auction environment on the day, the vendor may get a an uplift which um, might not be expected elsewhere. Mm. I'd, I'd have thought something that comes up in conversation rather more often is is buyers premiums. Um, I mean, be, because there are now so many more different ways to buy, to buy and sell sell watches, and it's so competitive to actually get the watches on consignment and get them onto your platform effectively. Is that is that an area of competition where we might see those buyers premiums squeezed over time? I think there's, um, it, it's not just the buyer's premium, of course. There, there is, um, by and large, if you're bidding online, um, most auction houses and most aggregator platforms will charge you extra for the privilege of bidding online. And there are a few, and I can probably think there's probably only about three or four that I know of in the UK, who either absorb the cost of those extra online bidding fees or by having their own platform like we do, I don't charge for online bidding. So the buyer's premium is also an issue. Um, we sit sort of comfortably slightly lower than most of our competitors, just to sort of have a slight edge. And we also deliver for free to any cut, certainly on our watch sales and on the individual watches, just about anywhere in the world. So we've, we've knocked off a few uh, of the costs involved, and that makes us very competitive within the auction market. Um, at the end of the day, of course, it, it's about the item you're buying. Um, you you have to want the item. You can't be 
kind of have to sort of obviously work out what your limit is in your total budget and then sort of extrapolate backwards what the costs involves of bidding with auction house A or auction house B might happen to work out at. And then that will lead you to your maximum bid price. And we, we seem to have been on, on a, uh, a, a never ending escalator of prices rising in, in the in the vintage and pre-owned market over well, feels like five five years now maybe um i mean are you, are you seeing any interruption to that trend or or any any changes because of the pandemic um you're right it just does seem to go up inexorably doesn't it you turn around and the rolex air king's gone up from when i, I remember many years ago valuing them at sort of seven or eight hundred pounds and now they're regularly selling at sort of 18, 1900, 2000, 2100 pounds. And the one thing that seems to have happened in, in, in the pandemic is that the prices have gone up. Whether that is a temporary status, you know, which might be a reflection of more people sitting um, with the time to spend to look at the auctions and go, oh, I'll just have a go at that. Whether it's a sign of perhaps people sitting with a bit of spare money at home because if they're on um, either working for home, from home or on furlough, um, they're probably saving on commuting costs, um, probably saving on buying lunch around at their local calf, yeah. normally ready their own fridge. So I think people have probably got cash to spend. Plus, of course, they've had nowhere to spend it for the last 14 weeks. The, the pubs have been closed, the cinemas are closed, the restaurants are closed. Very few people, I suspect, are having the holidays they dreamed of having this summer. So there's a bit of cash in the economy today, and I really do stress today. What, what it'll be like in a few months' time, um, if, if you knew that, I should think you could get yourself a job at number 11 Downing Street. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and finally, what, what, are the, what does the rest of the year look like? We're used to fellows having, having watch auctions every single month. Um, I see that your sale room has reopened and people can start viewing, uh, viewing products ahead of auctions again now. So are we back to a, some sort of normality or is there a new, a new normal settling in now? I think there's a new normal. I mean, we'll still be holding auctions, I hope. Um, we, we have um, a very sort of high level of... Uh, safety for health policy here. We, we have one of these amazing thermal cameras in our reception now that goes off if your temperature is above normal and also identifies you to our, to our back office system, which is not reassuring for my staff to know what my name is when I come in in the morning and that I haven't yet sort of blown up in frustration because my temperature is still moderately placid. But we've got some great sales coming up. We, we deliberately held back the more um, I don't know, top, how would I put it, top end, more um, high figure watches um, during COVID because we weren't 100% certain that they would um, sell well. We did have somebody actually press us to sell a, uh, an AP Royal Oak because they just said, look, we just need to get it sold. And uh, I was highly delighted when it sold for 55,000. So That's there's okay. clearly... Um, there was clearly an appetite three weeks ago, but we've got, in fact, we've got two watch sales in August. We've got a sort of what I would call a more of a collector's watch sale at the beginning of August. And then at the end of August, we have got the mother and father of all luxury watch sales with some uh, there's Pateks, there's early Rolexes, there's vintage Rolexes, there's nearly brand new Rolexes. There's, you know, at the moment, there are a hundred what I would call seriously adult watches in that sale as a Milgauss, and there's, there's all sorts of things there to excite both the collectors of vintage and specialist watches, but also people who just love a, a, a lovely modern chronograph and want to add to their collection. Fantastic. Well, I'll, I'll direct everybody to the, to, the, to the fellows' website so they can check out the dates of, of that. And uh, of course, Watchpool will be covering those, those auctions for you in, in advance and uh, we'll cover the results as well. So well, thank it's been, you. It's been great speaking to you, Stephen, and good, good to hear that uh, yeah, the, the team's all good, your family's all good, and uh, you know, I look forward to seeing you in Birmingham again soon. Well, we look forward to welcoming you, Rob, and, you know, and, and good luck to all, all of your viewers and readers. You know, the next, next few months, I think it's going to be a challenge, but I think providing we all sort of behave sensibly and, you know, 
neither think too much of the future, just get on with what's in front of us and deal with what's in front of us now, uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll pull this situation around. Absolutely. Positive mental attitude. That's, uh, that's Correct. Exactly. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Speak soon. Cheers, Rob. Nice to speak Cheers. to you. Bye-bye.